Baseball might push test cricket into an exciting new direction, but it's not without its own risks. Stay tuned to find out why next. In part one of this series, link on screen now if you haven't already checked that out, we spoke about how England's new cricket style had a psychological focus on playing positive, almost carefree cricket that didn't pay too much emphasis on the consequences. This focus brought England success in the shorter formats of the game front and centre into its test cricket. And when draws are taken out of the equation, it made for a truly exciting spectacle. And at its heart, that's what baseball is all about. But in the test matches that England have played since baseball was introduced, there have been aspects of their game plan that can be used to an opponent's advantage. And that is the topic of today's video, as we unpack four different factors that could affect baseball England at the test level. The last one is especially important, and I don't really have an idea of how they could fix it going forward. By watching to the end of this video, you should be able to make your own judgment on whether baseball is the future of test cricket or not. And maybe you even want to leave a comment down below. Now let's get started. Point one is, survive the first wave. This England side places a huge importance on early wickets. In the 12 tests that England have played since baseball was introduced, their opening spell with the ball has resulted in an early wicket 50% of the time. It's not just what these wickets represent on their own either. On eight of the occasions where they've got an opening wicket, they've directly resulted in a batting collapse. Like South Africa at the Oval, where it started at one for two and turned into six for 36. Or at Mount Monganui versus New Zealand, where it started at one for 14 and ended with 10 for 126. If early pressure turns into early wickets, it's likely been the case that it turns into an England victory as well. These collapses give the impetus of the game to England. They can decide who comes on to bowl and for how long, and giving them complete control of the game. Therefore, a winning strategy against England is about nullifying the impact of this opening spell. It's not so much about dominating the opening bowlers, but more about nullifying their ability to have an impact on the game. As an example, we can look at New Zealand's efforts in the second innings of their second test against England at the Basin Reserve in Wellington. Although being told to follow on after being all out for 209 in the first innings, still trailing by 226 runs, New Zealand's openers worked hard to stay at the crease and not give away an early wicket. Off 315 balls, the opening pair put on 149 runs for the first wicket and brought England's lead to a much more manageable 77. Kane Williamson was then able to anchor the innings, create a foothold for New Zealand with the middle order, and they set a 258 run target for England, a target they didn't chase down. Looking at the scorecard, it looked like digging in for the long haul was a clear tactic by the New Zealanders. None of the strike rates of the top five are above 50. Only one is above 60 in the entire scorecard. By picking batters with strong defensive fundamentals, their defense can then be turned into offense later on in the game. But there is another side to this tactic. In part one, we spoke about how Anderson and Broad are one of the best one-two punches in the history of Test cricket. Their ability is unquestionable, but by playing the long game, opponents can force them and the wider bowling cohort to bowl more overs than they would like. These issues then create wider complications for the captain. He has to think about, how much can I bowl a bowler without risking further injury? And ask other bowlers to take on more of the workload, like Jack Leach did where he bowled 61.3 overs on his own. And if their second and third options are conceding runs, that ramps up the the pressure with the captain even more. While up in the change rooms, the management staff will have their own concerns. Bowlers' workloads are managed to ensure that they can stay as fit for as long as possible. This isn't just related to Broad and Anderson's age, it's the same for all international teams and the rest of England's bowlers. They all have management staff that will monitor their workloads, and if the opponent can push the limits of these workloads, they can force the hand of the management staff to rest these players in the next game. Now it's possible for England to have depth in their bowling stocks to replace some bowlers, like they're aiming to do for the 2023 Ashes against Australia. But replacing Anderson and Broad, who have gotten 1,261 wickets between them, is a gargantuan task, and dare I say, perhaps an impossible one. And it's not like some of these bowlers that they're calling upon haven't had their own injury issues as well. The next talking point we'll look at is this win at all costs focus. Now this focus has set the stage for some really entertaining cricket and for bringing people back to the game of test cricket. And that should be applauded. But this focus, in its own way, comes with its own hazards. Now the draw is sometimes seen as the worst possible thing in test cricket. Whether that's something you believe or not, allow me to play devil's advocate for just this one time. Historically, success in tests are regarded on a per series basis rather than a per match basis. When we think of test matches, 
While there are certain great matches that live on in our memory, the thing that shines strongest is the result of the series and the moments that led to that result. Sometimes, although not as entertaining, a draw can be as important as a win, if it means that a series victory is still possible. And more importantly, series wins are what coaches and captains are measured on. For as long as the winning continues, administrators will not question the tactics that are on display. Framing this talk through the lens of the World Test Championship, a draw still earns more points than a loss. It's unknown how this recent England tour of New Zealand will be regarded in a few decades time. But what will remain in the records is that England created a situation where they lost an almost unlosable test match because of their aggressive mindset. And in the process became only the second country in history to lose a match after enforcing the follow-on. This and the drawn 1-1 series result is what will stay in the record books. To view tests as singular events and not to take the test before and after that into account risks the overall success of Basball as a tactic and England as a team. Because in order for this team to be regarded amongst the pantheon of all-time great teams, including some from England itself, it needs to win series and not just only matches, no matter how entertaining they are. For point three, I want to have a quick look at the opponents that they've played so far. Now, some have made the case that England's success so far can be put to a large part because of the teams and the conditions that they've played in. I generally think that these types of arguments are quite low level and get leveled at all the good teams, especially when they're going well. But in the case of England and for the sake of this video, I want to have a quick look at this further. England's most recent two tours away to Pakistan and New Zealand respectively had them facing some pretty inexperienced and understrength bowling lineups in both cases. Pakistan gave five different bowlers their debut during that series and were without stars like Shahin Shafridi. Not to mention the first test pitch created its own controversy for its road-like qualities. It was given a demerit point, but then that was rescinded after an appeal from the Pakistan Cricket Board. In New Zealand, the first test included two debutants with the ball and Neil Wagner opening the bowling, which is something he doesn't usually do at test level. Going back further into their fixtures, there might be an argument to say that the reason that they beat South Africa at home has more to do with South Africa's poor batting than it does about anything else. But that full strength South African bowling lineup restricted England to under 200 runs on four separate occasions. While it's too shallow and unfair to say that England won because of these reasons, I mean, you still have to get 20 wickets to win a test match. It does raise at least some questions in my mind. How will they go against a full strength Australian bowling lineup, which is at the same standard or better than South Africa's full strength bowling lineup? And how will they deal with the Indian conditions and the standard of Indian bowlers that they have at the moment, namely Ravi Ashwin and Ravi Jadeja at home. The only way we're going to find out whether this argument has real legs is to wait and see. And that brings us to the final factor in this video. It's this point four where I still have question marks as to how England are going to fix it. England's success is built upon a blueprint. Before the team is even selected, the coaches and the management staff have an idea of how they want to play and therefore the roles that they need in the side to fit that style of play. Therefore, team selection is not necessarily just about form, it's about finding the right type of player that fits the archetype of the players that they need in this side to play the style of cricket that they want. And with a deep pool of shorter format cricket players and some of the best bowlers of all time, England's transition to aggressive cricket has been pretty easy. But there's one role in this blueprint where there's only one player, and if he's gone, it throws the entire system in jeopardy. And that's Ben Stokes. Ben Stokes wears many hats in this side. He is England's lion, the proud captain, the face of the squad, and the number one motivator of all the players. He's the middle order batter who can anchor in innings or sometimes even put the team on his back and run down these huge run chases as we've seen in the past. And he's the fourth option bowler, the one that picks up the slack for the other bowlers and puts in the hard work when nothing seems to be going right and getting the hard wickets when it's needed for England. He is the most important player in this side, bar none, and gives the team its balance. But what if he's not there? Ben Stokes has been struggling with a chronic knee complaint for some time now. Whereas some players can be rested or even take a leave of absence, Ben Stokes has continued to play and play through the pain where at some times it looked like he could barely walk properly and his bowling workloads have gone down significantly as well. Although at the time of writing, England unscheduled to play any more tests for quite a few months now, Ben's schedule is still full as ever. He has the IPL, he's going to be playing in the test series against Ireland, he has the Ashes. This basball system relies on Ben Stokes, and Ben Stokes at full fitness, and wearing all the hats that we spoke about earlier. If he steps away from the bowling, another bowler needs to be picked to pick up the workload, and then therefore another batter needs to be dropped. 
If you get rid of him altogether, you lose not only all of his productivity, but his intangibles as a captain as well. It throws everything out of whack. I raise this point not to say that Ben Stokes getting injured would be a positive for the opposition. Ben Stokes is one of my favorite players to watch in the current era, and I want to see him play for as long as possible. But I do raise it as a talking point for us to discuss. Other than allowing Ben to play through the pain, no matter how career limiting it might be and painful it is to watch, I don't really see another way England could rectify this issue. If you have any thoughts or potential replacements for Ben Stokes, let me know in the comment section below. And this has been part two of a short series on Bazball. Now that you've hopefully watched both parts of this series, you might be able to give your own opinion on whether you think Bazball is the true future of Test Cricket or not. For me, I'm not 100% decided. I think it's still a bit in its honeymoon period and it hasn't really faced a true test like it probably will against Australia and India in the next 12 months. I love watching the cricket that it creates, but I'm not too sure about its long-term viability given its reliance on players like Ben Stokes, which really are once in generation player. Let me know what you think and I hope you enjoyed watching this series as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you did, please leave a like below. And if you're new, thanks for checking out the channel and consider subscribing. Here on screen now is a player that I think is going to make a big impact on the next Ashes coming up. If you haven't seen this video already, please check it out. Until the next one, take care and I'll see you soon.